Uh, I remember it was my very first sergeant shift and I got a call from the commander at the time, called everyone in. I'm like, everyone? What, what does that mean? Like, what's happening? Well, the flood's coming. We're gonna need all our resources. What does that mean? <laughs> my first shift as a sergeant and I'm asking people to come in on their days off, on their nights off and, you know, spend time away from their families and kids and, and their responsibilities at home to, you know, come for this alleged flood. The rain had begun in the foothills and in the mountains, and so we were experiencing water intake into Calgary, but the weather itself, the rain hadn't started in Calgary. So I distinctly remember walking along the Glenmore Reservoir with my, my boys and watching the entire reservoir flow like it was a river. Flood preparedness was part of my portfolio, and so I had some understanding of what I was looking at and recognized that there was certainly um, conditions that were brewing for, for flood. And then, of course, the rain started to fall and then everything sort of unfolded from there. We heard through the news media, you know, that, that the, the, the bow was going to probably exceed its banks and I didn't expect it to actually happen. You know, I've been in Calgary since 1998 and the river's been high at various years and I didn't, I didn't expect it to actually happen. I thought maybe the forecast was probably false. So the first inkling we had that this was going to be a flood actually took quite a bit of convincing. We had just finished four days of public order unit training. Constable PJ Shea, who's no longer with CPS, came in and advised us that the city was about to flood and that we were to return back to our homes or to our home base areas in districts and retrieve our kit bags. The city was about to go into crisis and that we'd be required for emergency management. Yeah, there wasn't a single soul in the room who thought he was being legitimate and we thought this was just another PSU test that we were going to have to overcome and after five or ten minutes of persistent reassurance we figured out that this was in fact something that was for real and a few hours later we were in a briefing. You know we all arrived to work that morning, uh, had a great meeting set up. I remember walking in with coffee and donuts getting ready for the meeting and, and the meeting room was empty. So it hit us very, very quickly. That was about nine o'clock in the morning that the, the plans for the day were canceled and, and there was big water coming at the city. I was actually violently ill uh, leading up to the flood. And I was sitting at home and we were watching the news and they were doing the live reports of uh, building the berms on Elbow Drive. And so at that point you knew there was a, there was a sense of kind of doom, impending doom over the whole city. After watching all this stuff on the news, I was like, I'm not gonna miss this, I'm gonna go in. Not often in my career, even now, um, you know, over 16 years have I ever seen a message that said, anyone working, uh, we need you. And uh, it, it gives me goosebumps right now even talking about it. But I remember standing at the big table at the front of the EOC and there was a number of people who I'd never met before and they were talking, uh, you know, quietly amongst themselves, and I was kind of overhearing this. You know, it's going to crest at this time, and it's going to penetrate these communities by this time. And I'm looking at the my, my watch. I'm thinking, you know, it's already evening hours. Like we're going to have to start evacuating like right now. One of the sort of foundational pieces about emergency management is that volunteering yourself or self-deploying is a bit of a no-no. It aggravates the problem typically. But I did send a message to my supervisor in memes at the time, and said, if you need me. I'm available. And he sent one line text back that told me to come to the Max Bell Centre, which I later learned was sort of a mix of an incident command post and a staging area. I remember leaving the office. We went westbound down 9th Avenue through Inglewood and we looked at the river. Yeah, it was pretty high, you know, but it's nothing extravagant by any means. And I remember we went, we turned left into Olympic Way and underneath the underpass under the train tracks and then we went and had our coffee and we took some calls in our zone in the 1-4 and by 10 a.m. the very roads that we left the district office from were gone. It was amazing. I, I didn't, I couldn't believe it. We were originally deployed to the Stampede Grounds for our first briefing and if you know the city at all you know that probably not picking a venue to do your briefing right beside the river that's about to overflow is a good idea and so we very quickly transitioned from there uh, up to Chinook Mall where we did uh, our initial briefing and you start to see all of these different people come out of the woodwork who had not worn a uniform in many years but who were being stood up in the interest of deploying throughout the city to aid in the flood. It was surreal watching the water come right up to the berm and I remember standing there and putting a stick 
to see how fast it was rising and it was every minute it was coming up it felt like an inch or two flooding all of Memorial Drive and I think at that point there were some other police cars that we watched get totally flooded out. And it kept escalating and kept getting bigger and bigger and kept broader and more impacts to fire department. We were moving fire stations at the time, evacuating over 80,000 Calgarians from their homes. We were flying with the helicopter over neighborhoods telling folks to evacuate because there just hadn't been the time that we would like to see on the front end to give them that heads up to get ready to go. We do have evacuation maps that guide our activities. It's not a matter of walking around and randomly knocking on doors. So our front line had, had implemented that plan. It was the first time it had ever been implemented on such a large scale. Uh, they worked really closely with the fire department, uh, EMS, Calgary Search and Rescue. So there had been this wonderful multi-agency integrated response that had taken place and, and homes had been evacuated. It, it felt like you were in some kind of apocalyptic movie, you know, uh, when you see all these nice homes with water up halfway through the house and having to walk through that and people who didn't want to take our advice initially. Now we're rescuing these people throughout the night trying to get them out, whether that means that they just didn't think it was serious or they were elderly and didn't hear our announcement. That's when the real work really started happening and, and when uh, we had to get the job done. The waters were still rising, so there was still more evacuations to take place. There would eventually be in the coming days a secondary search or a secondary evacuation that would need to take place. And uh, there was a lot of police work to be done. There was uh, protection in, um, of evacuated communities. Just keeping people out of areas, keeping people out of the neighborhoods, keeping them away from the rising waters. And that was our constant battle, chasing people away from places that they were putting themselves in danger was 90% of what we were doing. The first night shift, because the power was out, there was cloud cover, there was no moonlight, there was no ambient light. Towers that are 40, 50 stories high, and there's not a soul in sight, there's no light. Uh, so we'd put on our, our floodlights and, you know, to try to drive around. Just a weird, weird sense that you don't even see a human being in the area. So we went into our first apartment building and when we went to press the open button on the elevator door, the elevator doors opened and it was a waterfall cascading down uh, on the main floor. So we decided the stairs was probably a better option at that point. And what we did is we ended up going to the first suite and knocking on the door. And the person who came to the door spoke zero English whatsoever. Uh, and we tried our best to communicate them with them that the city was flooding uh, and that they needed to leave their homes. And they very politely nodded and said, yes, okay, and smiled and shut the door. We actually went to the Chinese consulate and got them to print flyers that said, we need you to evacuate. Uh, your building is about to flood and in the haste of the moment they printed get out of your house your basement is flooding which in a condo building it only creates more confusion and so once again we knocked on these doors not reading Cantonese or Mandarin and proudly displayed them these banners and they very politely read them and they gave us an equally supportive smile and wave and gave it back and shut the door and so it was Google Translate that ended up being our saving grace, where we would communicate as best we could through Google Translate, and we were able to get the majority of them to understand and then eventually start to make preparations to exit their building. We had a director, an executive director from the Calgary Zoo, and he popped into the planning room one day and I could see, you know, we had a furrowed brow and these long eyes. He says, we've got a problem at the zoo. And I said, yeah, what's that? And he says, um, you know, the, uh, the African savanna, there's water entering that facility. There's no way that we can get uh, these animals out safely, you know. And so I remember getting a hold of um, the staff sergeant in our tactical unit, and I said to him, I go, the biggest concern that the zoo has right now is the hippos in the African savanna, and as the water gets into the hippo enclosure, the hippos come out, and then bad things could happen. This was just a bewildering, out of this world, like you can't even make this stuff up, you know. Do you have any options? Like, what will we do? And he goes, we haven't trained for dealing with wild and, and, and aggressive hippos before. What do you want us to do? And I said, I don't know, let's come up with a plan. They had some MTC cans uh, that had now taken a float with the rising water. And so the tactical members were, you know, innovative and courageous and showed perseverance and initiative. And they got in there and they, they corralled these two hippos using these floating sea cans so that the hippos couldn't get out. And so then we go back and we're like, okay, what about the plan for the big cats? Like, what are we gonna do with them, you know? And so they had a plan that they could get the big cats out by boat. Uh, like a fishing boat, if you will, and they had these little enclosures that they could only carry uh, animals of a certain size and weight, and the boat could only carry a certain size and weight against the raging river that was going by the zoo, and so they could only do one animal at a time, 
back and forth until all the big cats were safely loaded into the truck and off they went. So that was probably one of the most memorable experiences that I had. We came in early one morning and uh, the acting chief, CPS chief was in the, in the room at the time and he goes, there's a bridge collapse and there's a train on top of the bridge. So you guys might want to start planning for that. We often refer to it as the train derailment, but it was actually a bridge collapse and then an almost train derailment. So that very significant event on any other day would have been met with an enormous response. There was a lot of risk attached to that situation and it was being dealt with by a very small number of people at the scene, um, largely the fire department, but we were there. And at one point, the fire incident commander thought the risk of the train um, cars falling into the river was high enough that he ordered the emergency closure of all of the bridges along Deerfoot Trail. So uh, those of us in the operations center pivoted from working on the flood response uh, into that coordination. And again, Frontline did an amazing job with very few resources. It was a, a big operation that on any other day would have really stood out as, as its own disaster. But uh, from a bigger picture perspective, it was another good reminder that even within disasters, uh, there can be very significant events that you need to be prepared to handle. It's a great collaborative effort with Calgary Fire, Calgary Emergency Management Agency to make sure that those rail cars weren't going to end up in the river and, and weren't going to have any type of hazardous material piece. But it, it takes me back to the, the compounding impact of things and how we ended up having to shut a bridge that went over Deerfoot Trail at the time and you've already got the downtown core shut, you've got the LRT lines shut, and all of this spider web and cascading impact that can happen when we get hit with something like that. We got a radio call uh, one afternoon that uh, one of the dealerships, the motorcycle dealerships, was bringing down a trailer full of quads. And they were indispensable. We were able to go into areas nobody could get into. And, and later in the week, uh, as the floods crested and began to recede, we were able to push into areas where people hadn't been during that whole week. So there are actually a couple of people still trapped in their houses in some of the areas of Bow Crescent. And so we were able to, uh, as the floodwaters receded, uh, ferry people in and out of those areas across the water. We were bringing food in for people. Uh, there were people stuck in houses. We brought a whole stack of pizza into one community. I remember being parked, uh, blocking a road, and uh, a classmate of mine ripping by with a brand new quad wearing full camo gear. And I looked at him, I said, where'd you get this? He goes, flood, man. And he's going around helping people with the quad. It was, it was truly uh, make do with what you have. We had a whole property that was covered in telephone poles that had been uprooted, flipped over and floated into the community. So we latched them up with the quads and pulled those off the property and, and out of the way. It, it enabled us to go pretty much anywhere in the city that periodically as we were coming through you'd run into a fire pit or all of a sudden find yourself up on a picnic table because you had no idea what was below you. Um, there was one apartment building I recall, a prominently seniors complex of which again no functioning power, no running elevator uh, and so because of that for a period of many hours we carried residents down the emergency exit stairwells uh, to get them inside police vans to then transport them to safety because they didn't have the basic necessities of life and so when you talk about the potential for loss of life that's when I think it was really starting to take hold that that could have been a realistic outcome for some of these folks. I carried one elderly gentleman he was so small I carried him like you would carry a toddler where you where you put your hand underneath kind of the back of their hamstrings and they and they hold onto your neck and I carried him down the flights of stairs and then we I handed him off into a police van to some other police officers and again spoke no English and just kept just kept thumbs up smiling at us, that's what he could do the whole time. And I can still remember him driving away, looking out the window at me. Some people ignored the evacuation. I remember getting a rushed 911 call from uh, a lady who was an architect working in her office and she's like, I, I can't get out, I, I'm, I'm stuck. So we parked outside this building and she, out she comes and, you know, water up to her knees. I'm like, why, why didn't you leave? She's like, I just didn't believe it. A lot of the flood it came up through the sewer system. So when you're going downtown, the sewers were shooting up water, you know, three or four or even five feet some points. People just thought it was their pool and their playground. And I just thought that that's so weird, man, because you're not, this isn't river, just river water, this is also sewer water, you know? And people just didn't care. They were in their dinghies and they were in their floaties and they're having a good time. As you were cycling around in anywhere from ankle to, you know, 
thigh deep water, not only are you considering like what is in this water that I am presently walking through because it was anything but crystal clear, but also just kind of managing uh, your overall wellness and making sure that you and the members around you are being looked after with extra kit because that then creates issues with, you know, with your feet, with your, with chafing, trying to ride a bike, with everything, with hypothermia, with just, you know, general feelings of sadness as you're miserable at 2 a.m. trying to evacuate another building. A memory that I won't forget is the high rises downtown. Because all the power was off, all of the food rotted and so the smell was unbearable. It smelled horrible. That, that was probably one of the best times in my career, despite it being one of the worst times in uh, the city's history. I had just finished loading some sandbags uh, to help uh, stop any further flooding. This little boy came up to me and uh, he had this little plate of cookies, the biggest smile on his face. And I remember he had a, like a Superman outfit on and uh, he came up to me and his mom said, you know what, he's been looking for a policeman to give this to since this flood started because he wanted to say thank you. When we're impacting kids, seeing us do a good work, and when they're that young, you know, like we're doing something right, it was a good, it was a good moment. There are some folks in um, the Emergency Operations Centre that were personally uh, impacted by the flood. And so, you know, not everyone was as resilient or was as uh, able to work through it because they were dealing with their own personal issues that the flood was causing for them. And so it wasn't uncommon for there to be, you know, breakdowns, right? Um, in, in, in the emergency operations center, people would just get up and, and leave. The stress was just too much for them. And so there were some really hard and heavy days in there. Emergency management sort of teaches you that, that you should be prepared for this, that your organization is going to be having personal impacts. And it's quite different when you're looking at the person that you know and they're being impacted and, and what do you do? You may need them, they may be filling a really important role, but you know that they, they need to go home and take care of their family and their property, their pets, before um, they're going to be able to do a really good job here. So uh, it's just yet another impact that you need to adjust. I remember as part of the planning team uh, when the group of Calgarians descended uh, upon McMahon Stadium. I think, again, going off memory, there was five or 6,000 Calgarians that came together with their rubber boots and their shovels wanting to help out wherever they could. And there was somebody in the planning section of the AOC who said, we don't need this right now. It's more work. There's more risk, it's more of a headache. And I remember saying like, we need to pause and think like Calgarians are coming together united to help one another through this crisis. We should really embrace and leverage that community spirit to do that. Public trust and confidence is, is the secret ingredient to surviving and thriving through a crisis like this. You can't replicate that. We've been through so many other events in so many cities across the country. They don't have the spirit that Calgarians had. They came out in the thousands to help people that they did not know, that they had no connection with, and truly made a massive difference when we think about the recovery from the flood. Someone would buy us breakfast, buy a whole table of cops a breakfast, and we're sitting there covered head to toe in mud, just like the pictures, and the, the fun and the camaraderie was just, it was just amazing. There's absolutely no doubt that this incident brought out the best of Calgarians. If emergency response agencies work with the public, as a whole team to respond to an incident, you're going to have good outcomes. The problems are gonna get solved and people are gonna do really good things. And so to see everyday Calgarians, you know, come up and work together hand in glove, literally and figuratively to work through the flood was quite remarkable. I think without the support of Calgarians, this community could not have been as successful as it was. When the going does get tough, everybody does rally around and that's very much, I think, trademark of, of what this city is about. Like that's how Calgary is, that's to the core is we just help each other out, like that's just what you do. I think that there are some uh, friendships that were forged in the fire, some formidable relationships that to this day we still laugh and joke and reflect about the time that we spent together. Those friendships will endure a lifetime for sure. And it didn't matter where you worked or what team you were a part of, to have commissioned officers, senior leaders in the organization walk through and shake every hand of the person that was in there and say thanks for coming, you know I really appreciate what you're doing, I, I really appreciate what you did. Those are meaningful moments that, that don't easily go away. Since the flood, um, you've seen our, our preparations for major uh, catastrophes and multi-casualty events um, improve. And, that, and that's because of our members looking back on situations like that, seeing where we fell down and we, we, we can't let the city down like that again. So we've learned, yeah, as a service. 
for a rapid response within a couple of hours, how um, the Calgary Police Service was able to deploy so many police officers, resources and uh, incident commanders to manage such a disaster. It gives me faith knowing that as a citizen myself, I, we're in good hands.